The last item on the agenda is a bulletin from the Crusader. On July 18th, To Live and Die in L.A. was released on Blu-ray and 4K UHD. To Live and Die in L.A. was supposedly scanned from the original negative at 4K by MGM, graded in Dolby Vision HDR, and included 2.0 original stereo matrix and 5.1 remix with legacy extras. The original audio track is wildly defective and of inferior quality. The encoding itself is questionable, with some definite grain manipulation going on, in addition to likely some further freakinizing. The suspects are described as a studio and releasing label, one doing the scan, the other handling the release. They avoided doing proper research, asset management, and quality control, and produced this no-frills standard disc release. Anyone having information about getting a proper 4K UHD release without these massive issues, please contact the special agent in charge, damn full idealistic crusader. Is there a license for a UK boutique label? There is no license for a UK label yet. This is what happens when proper covering procedures in terms of film management, asset management, asset research, audio research, transfer, scan, mastering of picture and sound, and quality control procedures are not followed. We got a film screwed up. You hear that? What do you want me to do about it? It's just a matter of time before they ID us. They got a good look at the disc. A review is crap without a researcher. They got to make on that bad 2.0 audio. MGM wouldn't have sent it out if they had anyone who cared. They're grabbing at crap. So what are we going to do about the errors? We'll make them buy it from us anyway, just like we planned, amigo. Are you out of your mind or something? You're beautiful. Kino. Like your work? <laughs> Kino, why'd you do it? Why'd you put out this heavily flawed UHD with heavily defective audio? Why'd you put out this screwy picture master from MGM? MGM, why didn't you get the picture and sound right for this 4K remaster? Hello and welcome back to this damn full idealistic crusade. This video is a review of the Kino Lorber Blu-ray and 4K UHD release of the 1985 masterpiece directed by William Friedkin, To Live and Die in L.A., which I consider one of, still, one of the most underrated films of all time, and in terms of its overall effectiveness and atmosphere, probably the definitive film of the 1980s, and for me, it's Friedkin's masterpiece, which is saying something, because I also consider The French Connection and uh, other Friedkin titles among the greatest films ever made. So I think this film really is is a crystallization of a lot of Friedkin's core themes that he returned to time and time again in terms of both story elements, but also his own creative process. And it was also done relatively outside the studio system. It was basically made with an independent mindset with a lot of location photography even on the streets of LA just as the French Connection was and MGM who was the releasing studio didn't really have a you know it, it wasn't basically done as if it were an in-house full MGM production who was in constant financial turmoil in the 1980s and kind of had constant ups and downs so this film being sort of made outside of the studio's full focus 100% of the time uh, very much allowed Friedkin to essentially do exactly what he wanted to do, which is what he did with this film. Uh, it was based on a novel by uh, Gerald Pedevich, if I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, but Friedkin wound up uh, writing the, the, the script with uh, Pedevich and basically transformed a, a lot of what was in the novel while keeping the same core idea. And Petivich had uh, experience as a Secret Service agent, so he was basically writing what he knew, which is always going to maintain that authenticity factor. Uh, for those who have not seen the film, I don't want to spoil it. It is one of the great cinematic experiences of the 1980s, and I do think is one of the greatest films ever made. It is still just as bold and daring today as it was in 1985, and the fact that this film did not not receive the widespread unilateral critical and financial success that it deserved as one of the greatest and grittiest uh, cop or crime films if you want to try and classify it as a genre film uh, it is just still a towering work that really defies uh, being classified in a certain genre it's not an easy film to pigeonhole it's a film whose style is 
so vivid that it is perfectly infused into every element of the storytelling, of the script, of the performances, of the visuals uh, with Robbie Mulder's cinematography, of the, the color palette. The design of the actual soundtrack and sound mix itself is unbelievably intricate for the time in 1985, and they're working still in the Matrix Dolby stereo form. It's a, 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 a just, and there's not a facet of this film that was not meticulously crafted to be as bold and daring and challenging to an audience as possible. It's not a film that you can just throw on and watch in the background. It demands and takes your complete attention. It does not treat you at any moment like you're stupid. And it is always perfectly encapsulating a lot of what we look at in the 80s now in terms of shifts in popular culture and the sort of rise of uh, corporate commercialism. And there, there, there's a certain sort of 80s sleaze factor actor that you get in uh, crime stories particularly and so this is reflected in the grittiest of films in the 1980s but no film has ever done it to the same degree as to live and die in LA and I, I think the only film that comes close to this in terms of getting that sort of gritty of the streets sort of sleaziness of the 80s in LA quality it was actually John Frankenheimer around the same time when he had his sort of comeback with 52 pickup so I think to live and die in LA and 52 pickup are two masters getting to just exhaust any of their demons from some past uh, failures at the box office on on films and just come back and hit the ground running in a similar vein and just explode in creativity with films that are very much produced almost like they're independent low budget films even though they did get you know studio releases and both films were similarly buried at the box office and only certain critics found them and, and championed them and um, at least to live and die in LA has a good standing now and is relatively well known and has been supported on video 52 pickup still remains in obscurity but it is the only other film that even comes close to the intensity and just sheer grittiness and the the, the sort of kinetic quality that only uh, William Freak can, can convey in a film. Uh, so that would be the, the perfect double feature pairing if you've always wondered if there was another film at least somewhat like To Live and Die in L.A. Also, uh, Friedkin insisted on having basically unknown faces for the lead roles so he sought out actors from the stage or who didn't have a lot of film credits this was also because they didn't really have money for stars anyway but it was the absolute perfect choice and so the film has a a certain reality to it but now the the main leads are are much better known so it's fascinating seeing them here just explode on the screen but the lead trio of William Peterson John Pankow and Willem Defoe are just, uh, these roles were just seemingly tailor-made for them. You can't think of this film without their performances. And uh, it, it's to Freakin's credit that he was able to recognize their potential and get them to sort of commit to this film and have everybody just go all in. Uh, and this was both for cast and crew because they were shooting the film sort of you know, sort of fast and dirty to a degree, but there is no beating about the bush on this film. There is no hesitation. It is full blown. It is no holds barred. It, of course, has the famous car chase, which is one of the great car chases in films and rivals Freakin's own French Connection chase. So there, there's, there's nothing about this film that is... Uh, haphazardly done or done without uh, story focus and atmosphere focus and every single aspect of this film contributes directly to the audience's overall experience and being completely sucked into the story and this world to such a degree that it's a film you never forget and is one of those films that uh, the first time I saw it I couldn't believe that somebody had gotten away with doing this and making something this intensive and this gritty and this no holds barred and if anybody could do this it was William Friedkin and for me this is his crowning achievement it manages to really blend together elements that are famous and iconic sort of Friedkin core tenets if you will of 
all of his films up to that point. So it's obviously got a lot of the French connection in there, but I think it has some of The Exorcist and some of Sorcerer because it has that kinetic quality that only Friedkin could really pull off, that sort of uh, just innate energy that also has a sense of trying to keep the audience off balance a little bit. And the, this can be seen in the sound design and the editing of the film by Bud Smith to try and keep the audience consistently just a little bit off balance here and there that's something that free can always like to do and it's it's this quality of always being engaging with even having tinges at points of what would be considered uh, ways you make a horror film. Well, Friedkin was always doing this stuff. And you even see it turn up in scenes throughout Cruising, which is, I think, another key influence on To Live and Die in L.A. Uh, I think Cruising is a very striking film for its atmosphere, but my issue with that film has always been that I never felt the actual narrative, the actual story was was strong enough. And so that, that was always my hang-up with that film. So I've always felt that To Live and Die in L.A. manages to overcome that problem and have some of that same just incredibly vivid atmosphere that really makes the story live and breathe and, and feel like it's actually happening. It's an experience uh, of a film, as all freaking films were. So I think he always had this sort of kinetic quality that goes all the way back to his early days as as trying to make short films and documentaries and things. And he never never quite lost sight of that. And I think it, it took me a while to figure out how to exactly put it into words, but once I realized it's it's a sort of kinetic feeling, uh, that's I think the best way to describe the the sort of freak style that that sort of kinetic energy that always means the film is active and it's always uh, doing something to have this sort of energy that's almost almost even a sort of nervous energy at times that does keep the audience off balance and. These elements are, for example, what makes The Exorcist still regarded as one of the great horror films because it's so deeply unsettling in areas. So if you look closely at Friedkin's films, I think you can find little core echoes in both themes and filmmaking techniques and just just elements of his style that are naturally there. So I think there is a natural progression. But overall, for me, I think To Live and Die in L.A. is is really the the crown jewel of his filmography. I think it has all of the elements that make his most famous films unique and so striking and timeless, but this film has all of those and it has a ridiculously well-crafted story that is unbelievably daring and has been imitated but never equaled. Uh, it is still one of the all-time great films about police or cops or crime or of course counterfeiting and it 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 really runs the gamut because it starts as a secret service protecting the president film you know it, it it's not again it's not an easy film to pigeonhole and it's also unbelievably gritty and realistic because our lead characters who are supposed to be heroic particularly uh peterson's performance as chance it, it, it's one of the most anti-heroic and dislikable uh, lead heroic characters you'll ever see in a film. And that's just part of the film being so incredibly daring and never ceasing to be challenging. This is one of the most important qualities that films have lost uh, in the years since. And that's also why I think the film didn't necessarily catch on in 1985. It also wasn't really marketed very well by MGM or really supported all that much, but it's also so challenging and daring and trying to be consistently intelligent and realistic and gritty and not just do the same thing that everybody else does that that is kind of off-putting to to certain portions of the audience or certain critics and I think over time and especially the more you rewatch the film I think if you feel that way maybe the first time it starts to sink in more it's it's a film that always rewards repeat viewings you're always going to find something new in there you didn't see before uh, some little nuance or some bit of a freaking genius in terms of a stylistic flourish he tried or you'll notice something in particular about Bud Smith's editing or 
Uh, you'll notice a, a particular moment in the sound design that makes a particular scene all the more effective. Uh, it, it is a endlessly inventive film. It is one of the greatest films ever made, and it has never dulled or diluted ever since the first time I saw it years ago. I've been obsessed with it ever since. And that also goes for the incredible Wang Chung soundtrack, and it's to Freakin's credit that he actually sought them out and got them to make this score, and it's I think it's one of the great scores in, in cinema, really. It, it forms a just a musical landscape to this particular story. And it's so the, the actual songs in terms of the vocal songs and the instrumentals are so perfectly crafted to fit the individual moments of the film that Freakin was able to actually take pieces of all of these songs and tracks and not just use them in big chunks, but kind of spread them out all over so that uh, if you're used to the album presentation and the fulling tracks, the fact that he's using little pieces all over, it almost makes the music feel more like just the sort of expressive background of this universe they're going around in or or part of the internal uh, character monologues or what they may be thinking it's just it adds emphasis to each of the individual scenes and moments and makes them little moments in time that are carved out so it, even the soundtrack and the, the music is intricately crafted for this film so of course this being a freaking film that means it's history on home video like all freaking titles is always questionable given his uh, nature and desire to go back and tweak things over time with uh, tools of the era whenever they would go and do a remastered transfer for a new format so actually looking at the film and trying to figure out if you've got a fully accurate to the original release version experience is a bit difficult to do. So you do have to do some research. And there have been a number of remastered projects uh, that basically started with the 2003 MGM Special Edition DVD where Freakin supervised a new transfer, new color grading, and a new 5.1 sound remix in addition to all the extras and the bulk of the extras being generated for that release originally. Before that point, the film had just kind of been dumped out on home video. It was actually released by Vestron primarily in the 80s and didn't really get any attention after that. So those initial releases on VHS and Laserdisc are pretty much the sort of untouched uh, version of the film in terms of it's an old master that they did back then. And uh, it's got the original Dolby Stereo mix and it's in a 133 ratio. So it's basically opened up. So it's not the original ratio, but that's the sort of warts and all as is presentation but of course could have been a lot better if, if it had you know been a spiffier transfer back then. The MGM Master for DVD eventually did get a MGM Blu-ray, so it got bumped up to HD essentially, and that 2003 5.1 remix got upgraded to a lossless 5.1 track, but it was the same. The original Dolby Stereo mix was nowhere to be found on those releases. And then that's how the film stayed until uh, Shout Factory and Arrow released brand new versions of the film with all the legacy MGM extras plus new extras that Shout Factory made and uh, used a new transfer of the film for the deluxe Blu-ray presentations. So this was a big step up over the MGM Blu-ray edition, but uh, we still had the same 5.1 track carried over, and the Arrow is the better option of those two because it was better encoded than the Shout Factory release, which is pretty common with with arrow versus shout comparisons from that era and also it was usually much more inexpensive so i picked up the arrow because i went region free uh, but it does include a version of the original stereo mix that is in lossless quality and of course has the matrix information in there um, it doesn't sound super great but at least it's there so that was a real bonus to that release but uh, that's basically how the film stood until uh, Kino announced and released this UHD and Blu-ray combo format uh, version of a new 4K master from MGM. Now, MGM has been going and doing these 4K master catalog updates for a lot of their titles. Most are being released on UHD by Kino, and they've sort of been going through, I think, and hitting some of the bigger sellers from DVD and Blu-ray in terms of, of numbers. So we've seen a number of really important titles pop up 
but the actual quality of these masters overall has kind of been hit or miss. And so for everyone that's a giant upgrade and really knocks it out of the park, others are not so hot. And then you get some like this one, unfortunately, for To Live and Die in LA that are uh, very questionable at best. So to talk about the picture quality of this new 4K master on the 4K UHD, this is a brand new MGM 4K master, apparently from a scan of the original negative. And while the overall effect is immediately, you know, obviously technically better than the previous Blu-rays in terms of the two different masters, um, if you look at it a little bit more closely, it, you can also tell that there's some weird stuff going on and some new stuff in this transfer that was not in the previous previous two transfers really. Uh, the first is that there's definitely something weird going on with the actual grain in this transfer. Uh, it's right there from the opening sequence of uh, escorting the president to the hotel in the pre-title sequence. You'll notice that there are some shots throughout this transfer that appear a bit soft. Perhaps there's been some DNR or degraining going on, uh, but also the grain that's there at points will kind of look stagnant. And if you look in the opening sequence, for example, around all all of the power lines and, and telephone poles that they're driving past. You'll notice that there's some, some weirdness going on. Uh, it's possible that might also be due to the actual encoding of the disc itself, but that doesn't seem to be the issue because if you look at the overall bit rate of this transfer as, as you're going along, it stays relatively high and consistent, usually in the mid 80s to 90s range in terms of the megabits per second. So this this does seem to be a source master issue, and it was quite odd to see this. There's been a lot of discussion on forums about this, this master, and I don't think anyone can quite figure out exactly what happened here, but that's one thing. But then there's also a lot, uh, actually quite consistent uh, amount of visible damage and wear that pops up throughout this transfer that was not in the previous transfers. So I guess it had been cleaned up for those. So when you watch this transfer, you will notice occasional bits of frame movement. There were one or two bits of fluctuation in some of the... Uh, especially in some of the darker scenes. It's very minor, but it is there. Uh, but you'll notice there's a lot of specks and bits of dirt that continually pop up, and even some scratches and lines that pop up in the image. And it's right there in the o in, in the opening shot of the film. It's just, it's right there. Uh, also, anytime there's an optical, because the film does have moments where we have the date and time that pops up on the screen in an effect, that's obviously an optical shot. So some of that stuff may be baked into those opticals. And when MGM did this master, they just did it as is and didn't bother to go in and try to remove any dirt or scratches that was in the original optical for those where the time pops up so in on, on those i could maybe understand that because it's just part of the original optical but again this stuff is not in say for example the previous arrow blu-ray so it must have been cleaned up for that version but again the 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 softer shots on the opticals and also having some dirt or scratches i can understand that because that's an optical shot and that was probably done in the original process of making those opticals it's the other damage and specs that continually pop up throughout the rest of the transfer that are more concerning. And this is something that is unfortunately popping up in a lot of these MGM masters. It's also in their 4K master of Ronin that Kino did a UHD of, which I was very surprised to see, which also was not in the previous Arrow master on their Blu-ray release of Kino that they did that master and workflow on. So this is something we're seeing in some of these MGM 4K masters. I don't know if it's just because they're trying to crank out these masters more quickly and not uh, doing a, a quality control pass on them or something, but uh, from the, the couple that I've seen so far, I am noticing that there are certain examples where, as, as in both uh, Ronin and here on this uh, release of To Live and Die in LA, that compared to previous transfers, you are going to see continually some 
debris, dirt, damage, specks, uh, and an occasional line or scratch. So here on To Live and Die in LA, it's mostly little tiny white specks that pop up every once in a while and an occasional line or scratch. And especially when it's one of those opticals where the time is printed on the screen, you'll notice there is a, a quality difference and there's quite a bit of dirt and, and scratches that pop up. So overall, I, I was very surprised and disappointed to see continual damage and marks and debris throughout this transfer. They're not giant, but they're continual. And because we're looking at a 4K presentation, especially with Dolby Vision HDR on, you know, I was watching on my OLED, these small consistent bits of damage are much more obvious because we're looking at a 4K transfer on a UHD. So it's, you know, it's a much more obvious thing than had this been, you know, just a standard 1080p Blu-ray and we were looking at this a number of years ago. And again, none of this stuff is in the Arrow or Shout releases or even the MGM Blu-ray. So if this stuff is present in the source that had been scanned and the same source had been scanned previously, uh, they did work to try and dial those elements elements down if they couldn't remove them completely. So that's a, a, a difference right there between the older Blu-ray presentations and this new master. Uh, in addition to this, I'm still not happy with how the film grain is handled in this. I can't exactly tell what's going on, but the grain shouldn't stagnate the way it does in places and also shouldn't have moments where it definitely seems like there's been some grain reduction uh, but also it seems like it's done in certain areas of the frame and not always entirely across the frame so it's it's again it's it's an odd transfer to kind of try and figure out and we're we're still kind of trying to figure out what what this source master was doing and and how exactly all this came to be but it does seem to be an MGM source master issue and not really a, an issue with the actual kino disc encoding but that's just my best educated guess because again none of us can really figure out what happened with this but it does not really look the way it should it's an improvement in areas for sure because it's now a newer master and scan and we're looking at it in 4k resolution but it's also not as consistently handled as say the arrow or shout releases previously and then we have to look at the HDR presentation. This disc does have Dolby Vision, and I do think it's been done pretty well, uh, but there are some moments where it does seem to be a tad on the bright side. We don't quite have that unfortunate uh, pop-out moment effect where elements really just like stick out like a sore thumb, and there's no light cannon effect, as, as was named for a lot of the early Sony 4K masters where they really went overboard uh, with uh, knit usage but there are some moments where it did seem like the HDR um, it just there are a few moments if you really know this film and, and you love it to death and you've watched it over and over throughout the years even though the, the older masters were never all that super great and had some degree of what I like to call freedkinizing, if you will. Um, you know, there, there's just there, there's a few moments I think you'll notice where the Dolby Vision here, it just the HDR kind of pushes a few elements a little bit, so they do come across as a bit brighter and bolder, and it just doesn't quite seem intrinsic to a 1985 film. But it's also harder to judge because Friedkin did like to go in and really push a bolder, more modern color grade. And I think there's some degree of that on all the transfers of this film from the DVD onwards. It's not major or crazy like things that we saw with The Exorcist or things he tried to do with The French Connection or the, the full blue teal wash that was put on Cruising. But there's, there's some degree of that. So I don't think we've ever gotten a fully archival hands-off scan and presentation of this film in picture and sound, that's for sure. But it does fare better than, than his other films. But do keep that in mind always that we are still looking at a freaking approved transfer that probably has some degree of, of that in there. But at least the, uh, the HDR is 
relatively tasteful and doesn't cause any major problems, but there are some other MGM 4K masters that Kino has put out where the HDR does have some definite major light cannon moments, which I will discuss when I do my review of Ronin, which unfortunately has a, a really glaring example of that. So to summarize all of that, the, the picture quality is... It, it's a bit confusing. Uh, I don't think anybody is fully satisfied with the overall quality of this master. And seeing the consistent damage and the sort of oddness going on with the grain, and there's obviously been some digital noise reduction here and there. It's not the sort of home run we all wanted and expected. This should have been a, an easy home run to just scan the film properly and give us a beautiful 4K presentation. That was a big improvement over the Arrow and Shout releases. And it's caused us to go back and look at those more closely and, and see, okay, well, obviously these are starting to show their age now and they, they themselves could be better. But just imagining if this release had been handled with more of the quality control and attention given to the previous uh, remastering attempt on the Arrow and Shout releases, I think we would be in a much better situation. So a lot of this does seem to be linked to this new MGM 4K Source Master, and I think the MGM 4K Masters that are coming out now are not really being done with you know, 100% quality control and attention paid to them, seeing as a lot of these are now coming out with consistent damage and marks and specs in them, as seen on both here in Telemdain LA and in the new Ronin 4K Master. But then we turn to the audio of this release, and this is where things get, frankly, even more perplexing. And if I had issues with the picture, and I certainly do, that it's still at least watchable and enjoyable, and you can see the new positives of this release in spite of the limitations and drawbacks. But the audio is so screwy and problematic that I think it totally mars this release. We are given uh, two different options, a 5.1 lossless track and a lossless 2.0 stereo track, which is supposedly or presumably the original Dolby Stereo Matrix audio for the film. Now, you would think that this would simply roll over or, or carry the same 5.1 and 2.0 tracks as the Arrow and Shout releases of the film, and the 5.1 being based on that 2003 uh, freaking supervised remix of the film. Um, that would be an incorrect assumption. Um, oddly, it seems like this new 5.1 uh, track on the Kino release is somehow like a slightly modified or tweaked version of the the previous 5.1 that was originally done for that MGM DVD. Uh, Freakin' never really changed any of the sound effects for this film, but they did play around with like the EQ and the, the level balance and things, and they tried to open the track up more for a six-channel environment, and they tried to beef up certain elements. So it's a it's always been a tasteful remix, but I vastly prefer the, the original track, but that was really not an option unless you were watching one of the old foreign dubs of the film, or you were like me and you tracked down the old Vestron video releases, or you listened to the uh, stereo option on the Arrow and Shout disc, which didn't sound as good as the old Vestron releases. The real giveaway that this track is certainly different is it starts out with a different version of the MGM Lion Roar. Uh, the uh, previous 5.1 mix was, because it was done in 2003 originally, it was kind of tied to that era of MGM Lion Roar. So if you pay attention to the actual studio logo sounds, you'll, you'll notice that sounds a little bit different. But throughout, it just seems to be not as good overall as the previous iteration of this 5.1 remix so i don't exactly know what happened or why somebody felt the need to go in and, and mess with some stuff but you know it, it it's still okay but it just doesn't sound quite as good as the last 5.1 remix and this just seems like it's been tweaked a little in levels and maybe eq'd a little bit differently and I, i'm just not sure why they felt the need to mess with it or if somehow this was just goofed up in a way and nobody noticed i don't exactly know but of the two options on this disc this is definitely the one you have to go with because when we switch over to what is supposedly the original stereo matrix track oh boy um this track is completely defective. It sounds horrible. 
It is frequently compressed. It has lost a lot of its dynamics. It has big volume shifts throughout. There are points in which this supposedly original track will suddenly shoot up in volume and get sort of hyper compressed sounding and then go back down i it was really bizarre and perplexing there is a definite loss in overall sound quality throughout this whole track but it, it just it, it it's so poor sounding that uh it it definitely is is in error somehow and some have even theorized that perhaps this is just a a screwy older um lossy track that was then uh, transcoded and put in a lossless container and somehow this this track got cooked up but if that wasn't bad enough the music sounds frequently terrible and the the whole track just does not sound the way it should you'll also notice there's bits of noise throughout this track and some of this also pops up in this 5.1 track so it's possible this is a new down mix of this slightly tweaked 5.1 track and to be quite honest the 5.1 presentations on the previous arrow and shout disc didn't sound quite as good as the original 2003 mgm dvd and the first mgm blu-ray so this is all quite confusing and uh, even more so because the overall tracks themselves, the original versus the remix, and then all these other variant versions of the original and remix audio, um, you know, the, the original remix itself didn't, you know, change any dialogue or, or make any major changes. It was just more overall opening the sound up, making tweaks and balance levels and EQ and such. And then different versions have different levels of noise reduction or limiting and things over time. So just trying to figure out what is the, the best sounding version of just the 5.1 remix is difficult. But this 2.0 track on this Kino release, whatever it's supposed to be. It's certainly not the original mix the way it's actually supposed to sound. This sounds horrible. This is noticeably defective. Somebody should have caught this. This disc should not have been released with this track on here. And even if it's a version of this new version of the 5.1 remix, um, you know, if, if they weren't going to take the time to actually properly source some version of the original audio, just they shouldn't have even bothered. This track is so bad, it shouldn't be on the disc. The disc should not have been released with this thing on there. It is completely defective. And the music is just trashed and how it how bad it sounds. Um, it, it, the, the whole high end of this 2.0 track is really harsh. And you've got those volume spikes and you've got noise and it's just it's compressed it's it just sounds horrible and for a film that's all about very intricate sound design for the era you know it, it definitely lessens the experience so of the two tracks on this release if this is the only release you have in spite of the 5.1 having some issues that is the better way to go because the 2.0 version just sounds I mean, it's just completely botched. I mean, I don't even know how this happened. It's so botched. Um, so that was just completely perplexing and mind-blowing. So uh, I, I cannot give a pass to either audio track, but, the you know, the 5.1 is the better of the two options because it doesn't have so many glaring problems, uh, and it's, it's, it's more passable, and... Unfortunately, most people seem to not notice this or uh, even bother with checking the 2.0 track because it is plainly defective. Uh, I mean, that's just... It should not have been released with this god-awful whatever the heck this thing is uh, audio track. If you're going to have the original audio mix on this disc, you should have at least just ported what was on the previous Blu-rays, even though those didn't sound all that good. And if you're curious about the best audio presentation of the film... That is the Image Entertainment reissue of the Vestron uh, 1.33 Laserdisc in terms of the, the ratio. This adds a PCM digital soundtrack of the original Dolby Stereo mix. And good God, is this the best sounding version of the film. It has so much more life to it. It is the original sound design. There are no tweaks going on. It seems like a flat transfer of original source elements. And if you dare to compare this to the 
heinously bad 2.0 track on the Kino release. It defines the term night and day difference. And this will show you just how defective and horrible this 2.0 track on this Kino release is. So wherever they got this audio from, it needs to go back. It needs to be burned with Rick Master's other paintings when he sets them on fire. That's what I would like to do to this audio track because it's so bad. Um, so... Sample it if you're curious, but it is defective, and there is no presentation of the film's original audio mix on this release, despite what others might claim. Um, you know, even if this was a version, supposedly, of the original audio, it's so badly degraded and compressed and terrible sounding that it doesn't even sound like itself anymore. So I certainly have issues with the picture quality of this release and this new master, but I most assuredly have issues with the audio, and in fact, the the audio problems are even worse than any of the picture problems combined, and any reviewer worth their salt should have picked up on this stuff, or at least talked about the defective 2.0 audio track, and that the original audio has never been properly restored or presented. Again, to get the best presentation, and really, I think, the best sound for the film, because it's also the original mix, you have to track down the elusive image entertainment repress of the first Laserdisc, or even just get the first Laserdisc with analog audio, or even the old VHS tape release with a hi-fi version of this audio and you'll have a much better time because that's how the film is supposed to sound. To briefly discuss the Blu-ray that's included, uh, for those who don't have 4K capability, if you're wondering about the new disc, it is from this new master, so you can get this release and just watch the Blu-ray for now. However, this Blu-ray does have all of the same problems in picture and sound. In terms of the picture issues, uh, this stuff is kind of masked more because you're looking at it in 1080p SDR, and if you're not more of a video file, I, I think you're probably not going to notice this stuff as much, especially if you're looking at the Blu-ray because it's not as uh, plainly obvious. We've seen this in other Kino and even other uh, releases where we have a problematic master or a master with issues where a 1080p SDR disc can sort of mask or hide some of this stuff. Uh, there's some degree of this even in the release of the Italian job on, on the keynote release. But if if you've already seen the, the UHD and you pop in the Blu-ray, you can tell that that stuff is still plainly there. It's just kind of masked a little bit. Uh, the overall mastering and bit rate on the Blu-ray is, is nice and consistent, usually around the 30 to 35 range. So that's good as well. Uh, but you've still got really these source master issues there. And it has the same screwy audio track option so you're still stuck. So basically, the Blu-ray here is a solid 1080p version of the problematic screwy issues of the UHD. Now to talk about the packaging and artwork design. This is done like other Kino releases. We have a version of original poster artwork on a slipcover, which is for the first pressings only, and then they stop making the slipcovers after they sell out the first batches. So uh, if you want the slipcover, you have to order it sooner rather than later. This has the iconic original poster artwork, and uh, thankfully all of the more modern releases do not go the MGM route of doing this horrible Photoshop job because for some reason they decided they had to remove William Peterson's face and alter the iconic poster. So thankfully this is now in the video past of the film. Here is the spine with the original font. And then the rear is the same standard generic Kino design. The case is exactly the same in terms of the art. So if you miss the slip cover, the artwork and, and design is the same. It's the same generic Kino layout. And of course we have the same rear. The discs are the usual standard generic Kino labels and there's no printed materials or booklet or insert or anything. In terms of the supplements, pretty much everything from the MGM releases and then the Arrow and Shout releases are ported over with one or two exceptions. So uh, there are no new extras here, uh, which is pretty much commonplace with all these Kino releases. So this is all legacy materials. Uh, the only extra that's on the UHD itself is the freaking commentary, which is a must listen. It's one of his essential director commentaries. And if you love the film as much as I do, you've probably listened to this, you know, a dozen times over the years. Uh, all the legacy extras are put on the Blu-ray disc, which Kino and most labels do. So we're all kind of used to that by now. But these are all from the 
MGM DVD and then the Arrow and Shout releases. Uh, all of the MGM Legacy Extras are still primarily standard def. They still form the bulk of the film supplements and are really w extremely well done. That was when MGM had some amazing people working in their home video department. So uh, those plus the freaking commentary are still the, the most important and th that's really the bulk of the supplements. But because they were done back in 2003, they're still all standard def and they've been ported over multiple times so they don't look so hot now and like most old legacy standard def extras they they actually kind of look best on the original dvd so you just pop that in and you can upscale those yourself um but you know those have been ported over to all the different releases but when you look at them here on this release they're obviously you know 2003 standard def files that have been ported over you know 10 different times now for their blu-ray shout produced a lot of extras uh, primarily a lot of brand new uh, cast and crew interviews which are just real treasures and it was fantastic to see those uh arrow was able to license all of those for their release as well so the the shout and arrow discs were basically uh basically the same with the same master and sharing the the supplements but again the arrow was i think slightly better made and encoded and and was of course far less expensive so all of that stuff if you have either the shout or arrow releases you've already got all of the extras on here. And of course the Chow and Arrow releases did port the MGM materials. So basically if you have the old releases, you know, you've, you've got all the extras already. I will say though, that at least the uh, presentation of the Chow extras on here, you know, at least it's solid because of course they are HD, but I don't think they're encoded as well. So I do think actually looking at the Shout extras on the Arrow release, even though the bit rate is lower on that, I think they actually look better on the Arrow disc than this, this Kino disc, but that's just because I also look at how extras are encoded and I notice things like this because I have problems. I will say though that uh, nicely the trailer that's included for the film on uh, the Kino release is the same as the Arrow and Shout and it does seem to be at least an HD scan of some worn old trailer so thankfully that looks pretty good and it's really rare for a film's trailer to get at least an HD presentation and it's important for this film because it has a really exciting and inventive trailer that was made for it which of course befits the film having such an incredible creative uh, editing design so of course they made the trailer that way too uh, but unfortunately the Kino release does not include the second trailer which is just as inventive and interesting that is on the Arrow release so that's one thing you do lose uh, we do get a really great uh, original radio spot ad for the film which was also on the Arrow but unfortunately the, the Kino version of the radio spot sounds duller and not as full bodied as the Arrow version because I even noticed that the radio spot sounded different <laughs> So overall, to summarize all of this, um, this is a perplexing release. It's certainly a release that has pluses and is a new master when compared to the previous Blu-rays from uh, Shout and Arrow, but also before that, the MGM Blu-ray. And it does have the extras and some of the transfer work dating all the way back to the 2003 MGM DVD. There is some degree of freakinizing on all of these uh, modern releases from 2003 on onward in terms of the picture and sound being sort of slightly modernized but thankfully that that is very minor when compared to the freakinizing he did to other films of of his own so at least with to live and die in la that's you know much more of a minor thing but we still need a proper 100 percent archival presentation of the film in terms of the transfer and color grading and having a proper presentation of the original dolby stereo mix without any sort of compromises or not sounding so good but then you have to look at the particular quirks of this release, the sort of weird oddities going on with the actual source master in terms of how the grain is handled, uh, the it, it, how the HDR is handled, and then also how just the, there's there's definitely some weirdness going on. But then also you have the consistent damage and marks and specs throughout the transfer that had been handled in address on all the previous Blu-rays. And then you turn to the audio, which is just a hot mess. And 
I don't like either option, frankly. I think they're both compromised and both don't sound as good as the Arrow or Shout releases, which also didn't sound so good. But the 2.0 track on this Kino release is clearly defective and should not have been released. I don't know where it came from. I don't know how this happened. But for the, the 5.1 remix to already have some issues and tweaks and differences from other versions of the remix, that's weird and odd and not good enough but this supposedly original audio track is just appallingly bad so avoid the the audio on this release quite clearly actually so i do have issues with the picture for sure i think it holds back this release it's enough to make me even question being able to recommend this but the audio is such a problem that it makes me unable to recommend this release so i think the audio is much more problematic than any issues i have with the picture and that says a lot um so there are pluses to this release it's frequently inexpensive it is an upgrade in areas over even the arrow blu-ray which itself is starting to show its age so you know if you have the arrow or shout release or even just the mgm blu-ray uh, you know this is an upgrade in certain ways but it's also a step backward in other ways so this is a hot mess <laughs> it's a mixed bag it defines a mixed bag upgrade and if you want to cover all your bases for this incredible masterpiece of a film one of the greatest films i have ever seen one of my favorite films of all time just for me to cover all my bases to have additions to have the best picture the best sound and all the extras and everything I have to have all of the versions behind me. You have to have the original MGM versions for what I think are the best presentations of the original MGM Legacy Extras. And for getting the 2003 5.1 remix without seemingly any compression limiting or stuff going on. But it's an older master. There is some freakinizing and there's no original audio unless you watch the film in French on the DVD, which I have done before, before I track down the original mix. Then you jump to the Arrow Blu-ray, which I think is slightly better than the Shout Blu-ray for the specific new Shout Factory extras, and then getting the newer transfer with a version of the original Stereo Matrix mix, but that still doesn't sound all that good. And the 5.1 on this release does sound a little bit lesser to what was on the MGM version. So basically the MGM versions are that remix kind of untouched, and then the Arrow and Shout was like version two of that. And then you have to have the Kino release for the new 4K master and the few pluses there, but there are no new supplements. All of the legacy supplements, I think, are handled better overall on the past releases, and the audio is just plain terrible. And I think the 5.1 remix on the Kino release is kind of version three of the MGM remix audio from 2003. And so why that is, I don't know. And the 2.0 track on this release is just plain defective and terrible so just avoid it and then you have to have one of the original vestron video releases for basically the most untouched transfer of the film even though it's not in the correct aspect ratio it's opened up to 133 and you lose some stuff on the sides and it was a very warts and all as is transfer but it does seem relatively close with format limitations and ntsc video in mind uh, in terms of how limited that was uh, it seems relatively close to any sort of original trailers or film elements you might see of To Live and Die in L.A. It's a very rare film to be able to see an original print of, but all the little bits and pieces I've seen over the years seem to indicate, and with this being a very, you know, as-is transfer done back in the day in the late 80s, you know, it seems like a warts and all as-is transfer, and it seems like it has a more natural color presentation overall than all the versions stemming from 2003 onwards, which all have some freakinizing. So, you know, there, there's that. But also, this is how you get the original audio mix of the film, and it sounds fantastic. And it sounds better than all the other versions, even though it's not as bombastic 100% as the opened up 2003 remix, which has now gone through multiple versions that don't sound as good. So if you want the best possible release of the film in terms of having all of the supplements as good as they can be, having the original audio as good as it can be, having the remix as good as it can be, and having the inherent pluses and minuses of both of the newer masters, you need all of these. So 
there's that. So in closing, I have to recommend that you do research of your own on To Live and Die in L.A., that you pick up a number of copies of the film and don't get rid of any copies you might have because, quite frankly, you need a variety of copies. And even if you were to try and combine different uh, components to make a single sort of fan reconstruction with the best picture and sound, you can identify the best sound, but identifying the best picture quality is still debatable. So... Even that's not a, a, a clear cut and dry uh, a project to work on. So the Kino UHD has benefits, but it has severe drawbacks and problems. And the audio is a major issue in addition to some of the picture issues I highlighted. So this is a release that is just, it's a hot mess. And it's so perplexing that I don't think anybody has been able to figure out exactly what's, what's, what's you know gone on in this transfer process. And I think, this is also, you know, symbolic of some of the some of the more slapdash quality that I think we've been seeing in these more recent MGM 4K masters. So I, I, I hope that MGM steps up their game and, and actually instigates, you know, more quality control because that's severely lacking everywhere. But, um, you know, if if they don't do it on their end, it will turn up in a problematic Kino release because Kino merely just puts out what MGM gives them and has no quality control at all. They just put it on a disc and send it out there. And if you try to tell them politely, hey, there's there's a big issue here, you're lucky to get a response. And if you do get a response, it's usually a negative one. So you wonder why you even bothered trying to point out that there's a major issue. And there are frequently issues with audio tracks. And especially when a Kino release supposedly has an original audio option, it quite frequently isn't, or it's a severely compromised version. And the 2.0 track on this release is just about the worst audio issue I've encountered on a Kino release yet. And that's saying something. So just be forewarned, the 2.0 option on here is completely defective. Kino, you are the bane of my eternal frustrations. Why? Why is quality control so difficult for people? It's not hard to do a little bit of research and double check your own work. <laughs> so ultimately... I can't really recommend this release. I, I think I've highlighted the pluses and then the severe minuses of this. And I think it will be up to fans or people curious about the film to check out this release. Again, it is very inexpensive. So with no one really stepping up to do a release, say, in the UK or anything, this is really all we've got right now. And you can supplement this with all of the past releases. Most of us already have a number of these, so I think you can pick up the new uh, UHD release to look at this new 4K Master for yourself, make your own comparisons, and thus you can have it on the shelf with your other versions for its particular positives, which are really just the, the new 4K Master uh, with its own limited uh, quality and drawbacks and various issues. But again, do keep in mind the audio is a major problem with this new release, so um, for all the reasons I've highlighted, do supplement this new UHD with past releases and hang on to your past releases so that way you have all of the pluses and benefits of those. And unfortunately, there is still no perfect release of this film with an archival transfer in picture and sound, and the best sound is still locked to the difficult-to-find image reissue Laserdisc with a PCM digital version that is lossless and is by far the best-sounding version of the film on any release. So as always, I hope my babblings about films and physical media releases and the very interesting, kooky, strange, odd world of William Friedkin films on home video releases and his penchant for going in and liking to change or freakinize them at, at all costs. Uh, it has been at least somewhat fun and informative. I wish I could be uh, more positive about this release, but there are so many drawbacks and the audio is so poor that I really think it needs to be highlighted. And this is a title that... I mean, for me to have to have all these different copies for different reasons, I think is quite ridiculous. And for this to be a brand new 4K master from the original camera negative done by MGM with Dolby Vision HDR, and for there to be all these issues and problems and for the audio to be such a problem, I think is frankly ridiculous. I think 
really, we need to just go back to whatever this new 4K source negative scan was and start from scratch and also do the audio properly this time and make sure the release is actually archivally done in picture, color grading, and of course, sound. And that's not happened yet. So it's going to take somebody else coming in and putting that work and effort in that MGM should have done themselves and didn't do and frequently doesn't do, um, whether that's Arrow doing a, a UK release and actually doing some work on their end because they do their own scans and restorations for films, uh, or it's somebody else. I don't know. It's possible that's not going to happen. This is just wishful thinking. But the only way I think this film is going to have better treatment is if somebody else comes in and does the hard work that MGM didn't do on their end and just frankly isn't doing a lot of the time. So as always, please do keep supporting studios and boutique labels by buying films on disc, even when they're really all kinds of screwy, problematic versions of a film out there. Uh, we still do have to show our support and get the best we can and try to cobble together this information ourselves. And hopefully if it's as screwy as this, maybe be able to piece together a version that's at least slightly better, but unfortunately that's not really possible in this case. But in any case, please do keep supporting both studio and boutique labels wherever possible by buying films on disc to help keep both physical media and film culture alive. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Like your work, Kino? Like your work, MGM? If I let myself go and buy some more new Kino discs, I'd maybe hit some bad new era that led me to buy past editions on obsolete formats. I'd either laugh or I'd cry, or my bank account falls down and down. I think it's that that makes me quiver, my money to keep falling down, 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 down. I wonder why I live alone here. I wonder why I spend these nights watching Kino Dis. Is this the dis the film will be stuck on forever? I wonder why in KL to live and die in KL. In every release announcement you post, I feel film's freedom slip away. I feel the bars come down around them and they can't get away. I'm forced to buy them too. I wonder why I live alone here. I wonder why I spend these nights watching Kino Dis. Is this the dis the film will be stuck on forever? I wonder why in KL to live and die in KL. I wonder why we waste our films on Kino when we could give films to another label. But they are held in some license agreement and they can't get away to live and die in KL. I can't get away. To live and die in KL I can get away If someone else gets the license Let's watch a film tonight Put on your copies Get away from Kino Far from the transfer blues Let's watch a film tonight Let's make our escape From the Kino disc And all the quality control issues We can watch all night We can select proper audio Hear the original track Transferred by others without errors Sing a lullaby to the other labels We'll be watching through the releases In the cool and clearing quality control With the sunlight of proper mastering And the diamonds of transfers And as you're falling asleep I will sing you a lullaby Of another label Wake up, stop dreaming. The sun is in the sky again. There's a canceled Kino release. And the rights are going to other labels. Oh, wake up, stop dreaming. And wipe the shock from your eyes. Are you ready for quality control? From another label. Wake up, stop dreaming. There's more than just new Kino disc releases. I'm saying if you want to get to quality control, you'd better license to other labels. Wake up, stop dreaming. I'm talking about quality control. I'm talking about picture and audio fidelity. And I'm saying wake up, stop licensing to Kino.
Kano desks seem designed to lie in wait for a chance to get involved in screwing films. And this one seems as good as any I've seen. So wait here with me until I discover new errors. I'm waiting for Kino to not screw it up. I know they have no quality control. And I can hardly wait. Evidently, there's a difficulty. I know they have no quality control. And I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. Wait for another label. I see you approaching with the release announcements. The amount and number got they're all so smug. But in a couple of moments, they will all disappear. Because they'll all get cancelled when we're ever so near. I'm waiting for Kino to not screw it up. I know they have no quality control, and I can hardly wait. Evidently, there's a difficulty. I know they have no quality control, and I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. Wait for another label. Punctuality was never much to me. Getting it right is the main thing. Forget about the quantity. Forget about the quantity. Getting it right is the main thing. The main thing. The main thing, Kino. Forget about the quantity of releases. Take your UHD by the desk and make her do a play-by-play. -play. And take your disc here by the encode and do the study that she should. We were so damn close to a properly mastered disc. We were cool on UHD. When I, you, and everyone we knew could believe, do, and buy a disc that was true. Oh, I say, Kino Disc Problems, Kino Disc Problems. Take your UHD by the desk and examine errors in there, there, there. And take your UHD by the audio and play it sync to the laser disc track. We were so damn close to a properly mastered desk. We were cool on UHD. When I, you, and everyone we knew could believe, do, and buy a disc that was true. What's oh, say, Kino disc problems. Kino disc problems. Take your UHD by the master and in her transfer do analysis. And in her uncode you find issue. And you need to fix it, and so does the film. And you need to fix it, and so does the film. And you need to fix it, and so does the film. And you need to fix it, and so does the film. And you need to fix it, and so does the film. Kino, 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 Dis problems. MGM did the Source Master. Kino put it on a disc, and the Source Master had problems. And Kino has no quality control. Fans have to fix it by themselves and combine old copies to make a properly constructed disc on their own. Cause Kino Dis problems. Kino, Kino, Kino Dis problems. MGM did it in the Source Master. Kino put it on a disc. Cause it's Kino, Kino, Kino Dis problems. Kino problem, Kino problem, Kino problem, Kino problem. MGM Source Master screwed it up. Kino put it on a disc. Kino, Kino problems. Kino problem, Kino problems, Kino, Kino, Kino problems, Kino, Kino, Kino problems, cause the fans have to fix it by themselves. Kino problems, Kino problems, Kino, Kino, Kino problems will never be acknowledged or addressed cause the Kino, Kino, Kino dis problems. MGM screwed up the 4K master and they gave this master to Kino and Kino just slapped it on a disc cause it's Kino, Kino, Kino dis problems, Kino dis problems. Kino Disc Problems will never be addressed or corrected cause it's Kino Disc Problems.